Hey, Sleepy Sheepy here. Today we're going to be talking about pairing, and this is going to be a kind of practical guide to learning how to parry, mostly in PvP. We'll talk a little bit about PvE, but that'll be mostly just kind of understanding how to practice different parry timings. We're going to be covering how to choose a good candidate to parry, when parrying makes sense within the context of PvP, the different types of parry setups that are pretty common, and then how to get organized to kind of maximize efficiency for parrying. What we're not gonna cover is like individual frame data for all the different types of parry and all the different like ashes of war specific moves that can be parried. So that's a pretty comprehensive big task and not one that's within the scope of this video, but this should help, you know, beginners or intermediate players kind of walk away with a better sense of how parrying can be useful in PvP. So I think it's important to first kind of acknowledge the elephant in the room and that's that parrying isn't common at the highest level of PvP and that's because it's a high risk high reward type situation that's really not efficient compared to other kind of high damage output options you have available and you're also kind of at the whim of packet loss as well as just latency. So you have two factors there that are outside of your control and it puts you in a situation where you're more likely to take damage. So that's gonna be kind of something you need to be aware of when understanding where PVP and parry and kind of fit together. But it's also worth saying that learning how to parry and understanding when parrying is appropriate is super important when trying to learn how to get better at PVP because you don't want other players to be able to parry you and having parrying as an option available to you can be useful in certain circumstances. The most common circumstances that I see other content creators utilizing parries in is gonna be in a moment where they feel like they're really in control of an invasion and that the risk associated with the parry is kind of worth the reward of good content. So you'll see a lot of people, you know, be kind of one-on-one -on -one with a host or playing against a player that's really predictable. And in that moment, they recognize that they can go for kind of a risky maneuver for the sake of content. So we'll jump into just a couple examples of that right now and just kind of see maybe why you feel like you might want to parry. This isn't to say that parrying is only limited to being a flex against other players that you feel are worse than you, but going against a really skilled player and utilizing a parry, unless it's a complete surprise, will often be a last resort and probably not your safest option. When it comes to parrying in PvE, I think PvE should really just be used to practice timings associated with different parries. So everything is going to have a different parry timing. So curved swords have a longer startup and shorter window than carrying retaliation. And ashes of war that you can put on a parry shield are going to determine the parry timing. So a medium shield versus a small shield with carrying retaliation both have the same parry timing, which is definitely important to note because using a small shield without carrying retaliation or a medium shield without carrying retaliation are both gonna have different parry timing. So once you decide on a parry tool and ash of war that you wanna use, then just practicing it in PvE is going to be important because it's going to give you a good idea of where that fits within the rhythm of the fight and then you can kind of just adjust that timing to be earlier in PvP because you're going to be pairing off of prediction rather than reaction. So my recommendation is to either use a carry and retaliation parry because those have really really good frames or golden parry because you get a little bit of extra range so those two are going to be probably your best options and most consistent when it comes to parry timing but if you want to flex and you know utilize something like a curved sword and put parry on it just because it's a really difficult parry to pull off and looks cool that's totally something that you can do the other way that i think utilizing pve is going to be important is to practice swaps so Hard swapping in the context of pairing is definitely not necessary, but it can be kind of a way to take your pairing to the next level. And it's gonna be much easier to utilize PVE, which has consistent parries, to practice this mechanic and these kind of windows of opportunity to take advantage of. So I don't think that you should go into duels and just try to parry everyone and then grab those reposts and weapon swap in the process. I think you should really practice this stuff on PVE ahead of time. And that way, when it comes time, you'll already have the muscle memory. Next, I wanna talk about kind of choosing a good candidate to parry. So before you've made the decision that you should parry, you should be aware of a couple different things about your opponent. And one, that there's low latency between you and your opponent, because if 
they're laggy at all, your likelihood of landing a parry is going to be pretty small. And then if your opponent is going for predictable attack patterns, so that's something you should be aware of before you kind of decide that you're going to parry your opponent, or at least attempt to. If they always go for a light attack after a roll, that's a really good sign. If they go for a lot of slow running heavy attacks, that's a good sign that you're going to have an option to parry. If they go for three attacks in a row, that's another good one. We'll kind of jump into these examples when we talk about the different types of parry setups you can go for. But those are all important things to note. And then obviously you have to be aware that your opponent is using a parryable weapon. So flails, whips, and any type of jumping attack are all going to be unparryable. So that's worth noting and then any two-handed colossal weapon or colossal sword is not going to be parryable but one-handed versions of those will be so if somebody is holding a ultra great sword in their right hand and a shield in their left you can still parry them if they're dual wielding colossal swords you can still parry those but if they're two-handing that weapon you will not be able to parry it all right so let's say you've decided that you're going to try to set up a parry against your opponent you have a couple different options associated with how you're going to set that parry up and there are lots of different ways to set up a parry but we're going to be looking at six in total that are kind of common and result in semi-reliable parrying so the first one is going to be kind of the dark souls 3 parry and that's going to involve holding up a shield usually a medium shield is going to be good and then going for a parry after two swings so this was really common in dark souls 3 especially with kind of the stagger mechanic associated with the first hit and if you have an opponent that you notice is going for multiple attacks consecutively that'll give you a great understanding of just kind of the predictability of that player in pve it's much more important to be able to react and parry appropriately but in pvp it's all about prediction you're not going to be able to reaction parry in most situations so you're going to have to prediction parry and that means that you're going to have to start your parry before your opponent has really started their attack or that there's any indication that their attack has begun and that's going to be the biggest difference between pvp parrying and pve parrying so for this method, it's really important to keep an eye on your stamina. When you're playing against a player that's using a really big weapon, they're going to be chunking your stamina and you might get guard broken. So if you do block for two consecutive attacks, it's likely going to result in a guard break if it's against a big weapon. But there you can see against that katana, I was able to block for a couple different ones just because the stamina damage was pretty low since the weapon type was a lot smaller. So having that in mind is going to be important and you don't want to get guard broken in the process. And this this is why this is more of a like beginner strategy rather than one that comes with more time and more skill. The next example we're going to look at is going to be the whiff punish bait. So this involves going for you know a charged attack or just even a light attack while you're out of range of your opponent which they're going to want to whiff punish. So basically a whiff punish is when you don't hit your opponent and so you're in recovery frames and your opponent goes for an attack on you in those recovery frames. So what you can do is be out of reach of their attack, so intentionally whiff, and then once you've kind of whiffed, you can anticipate that they're going to try to whiff punish you, and they'll come in for an attack, and when they do come in for that attack, you can go for that parry. So a couple things to note here is that you really want to make sure that you are far out of range for the attack that you're going to intentionally whiff because then you know they can't actually successfully whiff punish you and stun lock you before you're able to go for that parry but i am using a faster weapon with low recovery frames so that's going to be important it's going to be much harder to pull this off if you're using something like a colossal sword you'll also note that i go for some backstabs throughout this showcase and that's mostly because for this video i went for just a, a ton of parries and going for the repost got a little bit boring but i definitely recommend going for a, a repost rather than a backstab the next parry setup that we're going to talk about is going to be the roll in or poise parry. So this involves a player that again is swinging multiple times consecutively and frequently what you'll be able to do is kind of roll into an attack, dodge the incoming damage, and then when they go for their next swing you'll be able to set up a parry. So we'll look at a couple of examples of those and we can also do the similar mechanic rather than rolling through the damage if you can just poise through the damage. So if you use something like endure then you'll be in a great spot to just kind of poise through one swing and then parry on the next swing. 
So this is gonna be my favorite type of parry and the one that I find to be most reliable because you're really taking advantage of the fact that your opponent is swinging a lot and that is gonna be required. They need to be you know, going for multiple swings in a row, but that's not uncommon to see in PvE. And you also don't need to block or kind of juggle the management of incoming damage. You can roll through the incoming damage or even kind of surprise your opponent when you get hit. You can roll into your opponent rather than away from your opponent and go for that parry. It's also worth noting that coming out of that roll, the parry timing is going to be different depending on the weapon. So here I get hit, I roll into my opponent, I wait a second, and then go for that parry. So just looking at that again, you're going to see the kind of stun lock happens. I roll in through the next attack, and then I wait a second. You can see me walking just a little bit, and then go for that parry. And that's the right timing for a colossal weapon, but it's going to be different timing for, you know, a smaller weapon like a straight sword or a katana. The next type of parry is going to actually be a reaction parry in some ways, and then a prediction parry in other ways. So one of the kind of prediction parry methods is if people frequently roll and then attack directly out of that roll, it's really easy to predict because you can react to the roll and just kind of anticipate the incoming attack afterwards. So if people frequently roll and then attack, you can usually parry the attack out of the roll. And kind of in that same vein, if people frequently go for running heavies, that will be a great option to parry, or running lights with a really slow weapon. Those will be slow enough to kind of indicate to you that they're going to be going for that attack and you'll be able to predict the incoming swing and parry it. So those are both frequent options you'll encounter. The dual curved sword running attack is going to be one really common one that's very easy to parry because it has a ton of active hitboxes and it's very easy to kind of predict when that damage is coming in. So when it comes to running attacks, it's going to be easiest when you're playing against larger weapons. So here the Moonlight Greatsword is a great example of that where you can really see that attack coming in quickly. And then here we have another player with a large weapon. And you can see if we break that down, my parry doesn't start until I already have active frames associated with their running attack and I know that it's coming. Next we're going to take a look at another type of parry. This is similar to kind of the Dark Souls 3 block block parry but it's going to be a little bit different where you swing once and stun lock your opponent and then anticipate that they're going to be aggressive out of that initial stun lock and go for a parry so it frequently just looks like this and that's going to be a great way to set up a parry so here i go for a whiff punish technique it doesn't work out so i go for the stun lock one next and i do delay my follow-up attack just a little bit but then in this next one we'll see opponents with faster weapons where I just parry almost immediately. So if we look at that, I'm able to actually stun lock both opponents with my shield, and then they immediately both go for a straight sword attack, which has the same timing, which allows for the double parry and then repost. So those two were super aggressive, so I really knew it was a good option here. The last type of parry we're going to talk about is going to be an Ash of War parry, and we're not going to go through a comprehensive list of all the different Ashes of War that can be parried, but it's useful to understand that Ashes of Wars can be parried and that they can be reaction parried, because oftentimes they'll have very kind of set locked attacks. So one that comes to mind is Rivers of Blood, which has five attacks in total, and they all come in with the same timing. So you can wait for the first four attacks to come in, and if they go for that last follow-up hit, you can parry it. Or, you know, you, you can go for an earlier one. Bloodhound Fang is another very common one where it's a two-part Ash of War, where you can parry the first part if you want to, or you can let them go for the follow-up attack and then parry that, because it's a very consistent timing, and it's something that you are going to be aware of going into that moment. So for Ash of War parries, I really recommend Golden Parry. And if you have two shields in your hard swap menu, one with Golden Parry and one with Carry and Retaliation, you'll really be set up for lots of different situations. But here we can see somebody going for Rivers of Blood, you know, and all five swings, and I'm able to just kind of outspace the incoming damage and go for that attack. It's also important to know which are parryable and which aren't. So we have a player here with kind of a, a less common weapon, but they have Death's Poker, and I recently used that, so I know that the incoming Ash of War is parryable, and it's a little bit slow, so I do have enough time to kind of reaction parry that specific attack. 
Next, I wanna talk about getting organized for setting up Harry's. So the easiest way to do this, in my opinion, is gonna be this current setup where you have a medium shield in your offhand and then something to parry with in your main hand. And then ideally you would soft swap over to something like a dagger. So having a misericord in your soft swap is gonna be the easiest way. So you can parry and then soft swap and then repost. But this isn't always practical for every build and especially if you're min-maxing. So just kind of optimizing the amount of weight load you have for a certain build and trying to minimize the amount of stat allocation for endurance then this is going to require you know two things that may not be associated with your build and add extra weight to your character the next setup i'm going to recommend and this is going to be a recommendation for everybody is going to be slightly more difficult to manage because it requires going into your menu but it is going to be the most beneficial and kind of consistent within the course of invading and going for crits and everything and that's going to be to have a hard swap for your shield but also a soft swap for your dagger so what i'd recommend is you know min maxing your build so that you have optimal endurance for this type of setup and then have a parry shield that you can hard swap over to when you know that you want to parry and then still have that dagger for the soft swap so this is kind of the best of all worlds where you don't have a ton of weight associated with kind of extra things and you're kind of making a smart decision about when you want to parry and not committing your build to having a parry shield on you at all times. And then a dagger in your offhand can always just be useful. So I have quick step on mine, but kick would be a great option too. That way you can, you know, kick a shield and then go for the repost with a really high crit damage option. So this I would say is the most practical option, but it's not going to be the coolest. So kind of the coolest setup that you can go for and one that demonstrates maybe the most skill and is really mostly just associated with a flex is going to be to have no parry tools on your person at any time until you go for that parry. So basically what you would be set up with is, you know, dual straight swords, then you decide you want to go for a parry. So you hard swap over to your parry and then you go for your repost. So this is not practical for most players. It's also impractical for the purposes of latency and packet loss. You're more likely to lose your repost damage if you need to go into your menu and hard swap over to a misericord because the just delay between your repost and the initial parry is going to be longer because you are going for that swap. And hard swapping is a little bit so slower than soft swapping. So I would say this isn't super practical, but it is pretty cool and we'll take a look at it in the context of some invasions. So the ideal method for utilizing the hard swap to a shield and then hard swap to a misericord is going to be to delay that hard swap to the shield as long as possible. And that way your opponent has as little time as possible to react to the presence of a parry tool. So you see in this next one, I really have the menu kind of queued up and I delay it and wait for them to start spamming attacks. And then they don't really have time to react to the fact that there's a, a parry tool in the mix and they've already committed to an attack. So this kind of full length invasion here is going to be one where we had a host as well as a co-oper and that phantom is going to be somebody that I want to kind of take care of first. I don't want to try to be dealing with weapon swaps while I could get staggered by another opponent and that's another reason that the kind of weapon swap version is going to be a little bit less practical than say you know having a parry shield on your offhand and then just soft swapping. So what happens here is I wait for my opponent to go for a couple consecutive attacks, kind of run away from them while I go for my swap, and then run back in once I have the parry shield ready, poise through one attack, get the parry, and then go for the misericord to get that burst damage associated with kind of crits and daggers. So it works out well, but it is definitely dangerous and you need to be kind of aware of the full scope of the situation. So finally, I'm just gonna jump into some invasions that Perry and I found to be pretty useful. So in this invasion, I had a good connection with this overleveled Phantom. They were going for some attacks with the dual Lance setup and that can just do a ton of damage. So their attacks are gonna be kind of slow and I'm able to just kind of predict a little bit and go for reactions. Here you can see I don't get the repost damage. I think it sometimes is associated with incoming damage from another player, but I do a kind of a wake up Harry. And this was a, a nice moment where I kind of had nothing to lose. I'm playing against an overleveled phantom. And if I can consistently get burst damage, it may kind of win the invasion for me. So this next one is going to be a 3v1 outside of the Radon boss fight area. And this one is going to 
you know, be another one of those instances where I don't have too much to lose. I've got to deal with three players, and so if I can get some good burst damage on a really aggressive phantom early on, that's going to be great, because turning this into a 2v1 is going to be much better than kind of dealing with the 3v1. So I do land a parry pretty early, and then this invasion just becomes a lot of kind of dealing with the incoming spells from the host, as well as trying to get the burst damage on the phantom necessary to kind of take them out. I'm dealing with a lot of incoming spells that can potentially stun lock me, so it's not really a good point to parry this opponent anymore. The, the first player had dual daggers, which come out with so many consecutive hits that they're a better candidate to parry than somebody with a, a twin blade, especially now that kind of the rhythm of the fight has been established, where I know that there are lots of incoming spells and the potential to get stun locked is pretty intense, and I also have the potential to get blood loss buildup that results in a stun lock from just kind of blood loss. So those things are all kind of going through my mind as I'm trying to determine how to deal with this invasion, but ultimately I am able to get a quick flaming strike on the host, which basically one shots them, which kind of makes me understand why they're able to do so much damage with their spells. And then now it's just a one-on-one -on -one with me and the phantom, so I am able to kind of go for that more risky parry, and I don't have to worry about the incoming damage from the host. This last invasion is going to be from a showcase I did with the Family Heads flail setup, and this was against a player that was light rolling with a high poise build and a heavy thrusting sword and was kind of just going for jumping attacks or whiff punishes and then running out. So this is a very difficult setup to deal with, and I definitely needed an option that was different than kind of the dual flail setup that I initially went for. So you can see this is what a uh, parry might look like at higher level. I go for one very early just with a hard swap, and it doesn't work out. So I spend kind of the rest of the invasion hoping to bait my opponent into some predictable attacks. And they've also changed their play style. So they're going for mostly non-parryable attacks now. They're going for jumping attacks as well as, you know, flaming strike, but just the startup because the follow-up is parryable. So they're kind of aware of the presence of the parry shield and are adjusting for it. And that's one of the things that you'll definitely see at higher level kind of PvP where, you know, people who know what they're doing don't want to get parried and, you know, it, it makes sense. It doesn't feel good to get parried and, you know, this player definitely wants to win their taunter tongued in an area with no PvE. Their setup is, you know, I, I wouldn't say broken, but having light roll on a high poise build and kind of just going for whiff punishes and not being aggressive at all other than those kind of whiff punishes that are hard to deal with like a jumping attack where you can just roll out of it very quickly that's gonna be a setup that you know is very frustrating for players to deal with and having a tool like a parry as an option is gonna be really important in these instances now had i had a more optimized build for pvp in general like if i wasn't just doing a showcase with a really bad weapon then it would have been great to kind of use something else, but I did have a parry tool on my build, so this made sense. And so eventually I do notice that my opponent is going for a lot of attacks out of their rolls, and that's a very common option to parry. So I do have my kind of weapon swap on lock, so I am able to go for that repost and kind of defeat the player that was called I'm a troll. So, you know, clearly definitely trying to troll people and just having that parry as an option in that context and being patient really paid off. That pretty much covers everything that I wanted to say about pairing and how to utilize it in the context of just kind of practical invading terms. If you have any questions about the process as a whole, definitely let me know. Also, if you made it this far and wouldn't mind considering subscribing, I'd definitely appreciate it. But yeah, that's all I got, and I hope you have good luck learning how to parry.